How many years do you reckon it would have taken me to put that together if I just said, fuck it, I'm not releasing it till it's all done? I think you'd have got about halfway and and ran off into the desert screaming. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 550 of the Dead Robot Society. I know that it shocks you that we have been alive this long, because it shocks us. <laughs> alive this long or on air this long? Either or both. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> I'm having fun, Paul. How are you? Uh, apparently, I'm living in a place where it's about to get dark for no damn reason. Oh, yeah. Clouds, rain. That would be good. Uh, yeah. I'm through my massive deadlines and uh, wrapped up the first part of Derelict Trident the other day. So I'm busy editing on that while I'm writing the rest of Derelict Trident and working on another book. So how did your presentation go? Uh, oh, the app I wrote uh, when it got released apparently got rave reviews and all that was good and groovy. Um, I have no idea what the fallout from all that garbage is going to be yet, but the robot, we still have not been able to demo. We're going to try and do that this weekend. We keep running into some hardware problems. So, Obviously, you need more sentience in your robots. Uh, more sentience in my robots. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, I, I posted something the other day about my YouTube st stats for uh, shadowpublications.com, and I'm up to 43,000 uh, hours watched which is just astounding in you, so many ways. You need to tell your mom to spend less time on the internet. Oh, shut up. So uh, something happened with the Black Evolution. It has really sparked the other books uh, um, in that series uh, getting picked up on YouTube, which is very interesting to me. So I'm, I'm kind of watching that. Maybe in a month or two, I'll have a report that makes sense instead of looking at it going, yeah, that's pretty cool, not knowing what it means in the large scheme of things. I think you are becoming... One of those YouTube models, one of those YouTube bikini models. That's no, that's what's doing it. Nobody wants to see me in a bikini or a man's sock or any of that other garbage, whatever. <laughs> I don't know that I could get that visual out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. So what he come dressed as for Halloween? He came naked except for a man sock. You remember that uh that um Sean Connery thing where he's like in this, this set of blue, of red panties. That was what he came in. Zardoz. That's the one. Zardoz. No. Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> no. He got paid to do that. <laughs> yeah, I, would I hope think so. I, I think I would turn down the money and don't. I don't do think Connery. Not. I don't think Connery ever turned down a movie. That's a big movie with absolute shite script, but it's got good catering. I'm in. Is there haggis? Is there haggis? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're already broken down. What the fuck have you been up to? I just wrapped up editing on Blood of Patriots. And so after we record this episode or the this intro, I am off to, to get it sent to the editor so I can start writing short stories tomorrow morning. Ooh, ah. I am so ready. I like editing. I like getting the story done, but it's nice to be at the end of that particular process so that I can start writing fresh content. I've got people to kill and possums to populate. Possums to populate? Yeah, story with. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's okay. You'll understand when I'm done writing. I don't think I want to know. I really don't think I want to know. Trust me, you're not going to like what happens to you. Uh -huh, I'm sure. I was waiting you know, for you to guess what was going to happen, but no, no guess from you. No guess from me. All right, Terry, what's going to happen? It's going to involve a, a leaf blower. It has to. <sighs> Possums, leaf blowers, lawnmowers. And a copy of the street. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I'm curious. I should have that scene written in a couple of days. Oh my God. <laughs> Trust me, dying in an outhouse is not the worst thing that can happen to you. Okay. Words now of wisdom I'd never thought I'd hear. 
Now I'm happy. <laughs> now you're happy. Now I'm happy. Well, why don't you be so happy and get the goddamn episode started then? Well, I want to talk about something in specific. I want to talk about common sense characters. And I realize that's probably, you know, a very esoteric concept, but let's get into it. Well, this is not a topic, but mm -hmm. I was listening to uh, um, Thurlow McTiernan's uh, The Scholar. I really loved the first book in that series, and the second book was even better in a lot of ways. But I'm listening to the audiobook, and I hear her doing, hear the writer doing the same kind of stuff that I do. But when I'm listening to them do it, it's not nearly as annoying. Maybe so, when you're doing it, it's not nearly as annoying to everyone else either. Yeah, exactly. So I was doing some sound checks today on before I released the Patreon episode of Evolution. It was kind of one of those, okay, that's really not that bad moments. We can be overly critical of what we're doing and take perfectionism a little too far in what we're doing, thinking that if we're not perfect, it's going to drive people away. It's going to do something terrible to them. It's, it's one of the forms of fear that we as creators deal with. Oh, yeah. And you oh, yeah. just got to come to a point where you say, it's good enough. I can't make it perfect. In fact, trying to make it perfect will make it worse. That's, that's, I have been getting to that point and able to accept it more and more. It's just one of these deals where, uh, uh, when you're, <laughs> when you're on the downward cycle, it doesn't matter what you know. It doesn't matter, uh, how many awards you have hanging on a, anywhere on a desktop or how many reviews you have that are good or anything else. It's just, it doesn't matter. You just crash. And there's uh, all too often, if, if you keep doing that often enough, I think basically you start believing it even when you're, when you're not in those moments. So it was just one of those weird deals where this is the first time I've really attempted to listen to myself uh, since the med switch. And uh, it's strange how that seems to be helping even in that regard. When I started writing... I ran into the thing of, of being terrified that if I didn't have, you know, all the errors fixed in, in words that I was putting in there, if I didn't have, you know, all the typos fixed that the universe would come to an end and, and I'd get horrible, terrible reviews. And I discovered that virtually no one noticed. Even when I went, had the, the older stuff taken through a copy editor through a proofreader rather and cleaned up, I could see all the things that were there, yet no one really commented. It's because we, as creators, obsess about the details, whereas the consumers care about the product as a whole. Oh, yeah. yeah. If you've got too much or too egregious of a, a problem, then you're going to run into, into issues. But if it's... If, Typos, for example, if you've got a few, <laughs> if you've got a few, that's okay. If there's a certain threshold that each person has of where they've hit too many of those typos and it suddenly becomes a problem. Well, yeah. As long as you're below the threshold for most people, you're great. Now, when I first started putting it out, um, there was someone of an editorial state of mind that told me how many errors they could deal with in a certain period of time they were far the exception rather than the rule right most people did not care that person did i accept that sometimes you do, you've got to have the concept of acceptable losses when it comes to readers sure. because you can't please everyone oh hell and no. if you if you try to make something perfect you'll just take your voice right out of it and i learned book after book my my sensitivity to that sort of thing has become lessened. At this point, I make a best effort to get all the typos and the phrasing as clean as I possibly can, and then I release it. I'm done. It goes through a proofreading, and, and I'm finished with it. And if somebody sends me a note saying, hey, you made a typo here, you missed a word here, I'll fix it. No problem. 
I've got no stress doing that. I get very few of those. So apparently I was way obsessing when this began. <laughs> now I now I care to a minimal degree and that's it. My life is a lot happier now that I don't. What is your particular limit when you pick up a story? How many mistakes can it have on say the first 10 pages? You know, I think we are getting into a topic. <laughs> and I say this Ow. because I say this because what I was going to suggest we talk about was how a story that I was recently listening to on Audible turned me off to the point to where I dropped the book. Damn it, that, why do you that do rarely you, happens? Why do you insist on listening to my recordings? I'm a I'm a masochist. I can't help myself. It's a it's a curse. <laughs> he saw a two-time parsec award loser on there and went, oh yeah. I dare you to put that on the cover. I completely <laughs> double dare you to put that on the cover. Well, you know, um, it would be nice if those things ended up on the cover of my books, but you know, let's not even go there, shall that's, we? That's a totally other issue. But what I'm <laughs> what I'm declaring here is that unlike the usual meandering where we go for half an hour and find out we're in the middle of a topic and the show has already started, I'm declaring the show has in fact actually started, but only after about five minutes. <laughs> so that's an improvement, right? <laughs> That's got to be an improvement. Wandering. Wandering. We didn't actually wander onto this topic. We pretty much landed on it right off the bat. You were just mistaken about this not being a topic. I made the mistake of opening my mouth and tell you what I was thinking. I don't think that's a mistake. <laughs> now, I may condemn oh, you for being wrong, wrong, but it's not a mistake. Oh, right. Yeah, well. Um, before I went on this little rampage about this being a topic... What were we what saying? Was the topic again? <laughs> no, I, I know the topic, but did were we making a point before I actually said no? This is I, I was I was making a comparison between it and the audiobook. Right. And yeah. then you asked a question. Yeah. So that's where we were. Um do I have a point where it's too much? Was the question. I do have a point. I can't tell you exactly what it is, but it would be a serious repetition of spelling errors. They would have to come pretty hard and fast for me to go ahead and do it because I'm sensitive to it to a degree, but nowhere near what maybe other people are. I can deal with it for a little bit, but if, if you haven't put your work through a proofreader, I'm probably going to put your stuff down because there needs to be at least a minimum level of, of professionalism there minimal level of professionalism <sighs> i agree with you if you can't be bothered to run spell check uh you've made your first fail <laughs> even even just running spell check would probably clean a manuscript up enough for me not to be totally wigged out about errors yeah the problem is 60 to 70 percent of them the problem is most people will run spell check and then they will go back and edit things and not run it again <laughs> once they're again. finished. <laughs> or if your writing is so grammatically insufficient. Grammatically? Terry's grammatic, word grammatically, of the day. <laughs> grammatically, perhaps, incorrect, then I'm going to go ahead and, and have problems with that. If you can't form at least relatively decent sentences... That makes sense. If you get your <laughs> verbs and nouns out of order, there's going to be problems. So I should stop listening to this show right now. <laughs> hey, thank God we don't have a transcript. No shit. <laughs> Although, um, that is a feature that we could look into at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not really sure I want that out there in written form. <laughs> it's better if it's not. Less evidence that way. <laughs> Let's go with that. <laughs> what about you? Uh, with audiobooks, there is definitely a very fast limit. If the if the audio quality is shite, or if the narrator is uh, sounds like they're well, I guess that, that goes back to audio quality. If they sound like it was recorded in a tin cam, we have a problem. And if they're dumb enough to use effects and not know how to use them properly, I will definitely switch it off. Done deal. 
there was an audiobook I listened to a year and a half, two years ago that I tried to listen to that I made the mistake. I, I do this an awful lot. I'll buy an audiobook without listening to the quality of the narrator just on general principles because most times it's going to be okay. There are a few notable exceptions to that. In this one, the, the story premise sounded very interesting. The characters sounded very interesting. And then when I started listening to the thing, the narrator was all measly and had this accent for his characters. I'm like, oh my God, stop talking. <laughs> oh my God, stop. <laughs> I could literally not get past the opening scene because the the character sounded smarmy and nasally. And I was like, this is not a hero voice. This is not a hero voice. I must stop now or I will strangle someone. <laughs> Bad I, choice in narrators, in my personal opinion. I think that's also one of the dangers of uh, audiobooks in general, is uh, whoever the performer is could could find the voice for that character that makes no sense in your head at all. It's true. And there have been instances where um, even a seasoned, very experienced narrator, if you don't give them enough information... They will make a choice for you, and it might not be one that you approved of. For example, working with Veronica, she's been terrific, but she's learned to run you know, the more risque voices out, the more different ones past me, at least a sample of them, to make sure that I'm, I'm good with that because I wasn't clear what the Pentagon sounded like. I had in my brain that they were like ultra, they were like upper class English speaking. And she gave them a Russian accent. And I was just, <laughs> I was just knocked sideways. I was like, if I didn't already have something in my mind, maybe I'd be good. But holy moly, I'm like, oh, please change this. I, please, I'm oh. so sorry. Oh, that's and awful. it was all my fault. All my fault because it's all your fault. I, it is. Because I didn't specify what I thought those characters should sound like. And she did her best to go ahead and make them unique. And it just, it ran over me and my personal expectations. And she had a little bit of redoing to do. And I'm grateful that she did it. <laughs> You're grateful she didn't kill you. <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, I absolutely am. There's got to be some set of rules somewhere of how oh, yeah. writers are supposed to deal with narrators. Yet I've never seen it. Well, somebody should somebody should put together a list. Here's a checklist. Do these things when dealing with a narrator. Here is the checklist. If you in this story have given a character a specific accent or described their voice, you need to make sure the narrator is aware of that. Otherwise, they'll be talking with a New York accent and then come across a Southern drawl and be like, what the fuck? <laughs> or if you've got a certain pronunciation of something in oh, mind yeah. and then they pronounce it completely differently. And you're like, no, no, that's, that's not how that is. And that, that personal one has not happened to me. So I, I haven't had that issue. Veronica has been great to work with and it's only been the Russian accent. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's an easy thing to happen. Um, obviously we, we lose, we'll lose control of this stuff. If, if uh, under certain conditions, depending on who's producing the audio or, or maybe the publisher is doing it, you know, you're kind of, sometimes you could get stuck with what you have, but at the same time, it, it's not always bad to hear somebody else's uh, interpretation of that character. That is also a trap to fall into. That is the trap that I fell into where the Russian accent happened because I became inured with, with being surprised pleasantly by what Veronica was coming up with. And then I wasn't for that one thing. <laughs> it's all good and groovy until it's it wasn't <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, I, I guess what I'm, what I, I guess what I'm really getting at is the, uh, um, the performers have to have space to make it theirs as well. Mm -hmm. um, you're the director. You can't act for the actor. You're the director. You have to let the actor do what they do. It's you're giving them instructions on how you'd like it done. 
on maybe uh, uh, how you how something needs to be enunciated in a certain scene or uh, the kind of expression you're trying to catch in the nuance of their voice. But they still have to do what they do, which is pull it out of thin air and make it work. That's not an easy trick. Well, and it's not. It, it, I think the collaborative uh, collaboration is the best way to do it, unless you have somebody who knows your work has already has already read books in that series and they already know what's up. And if you've already done that, it's like, OK, these big characters may, you know, have as much fun with them as you want, because it doesn't matter. They're there for comic relief or they're there just for red shirts. Treat them appropriately. <laughs> of course, that could come at you from a completely different angle under certain circumstances. I remember Veronica telling me that she uh, walked in and found her husband reading an empire book. And she leaned over his shoulder and started narrating it at him. <laughs> and he was like, stop that. <laughs> I, I've, um, she probably remembers a lot more than you do about words you've written. Which is really funny, but think about it. She probably does. As many times as you've read them, you have probably not spoken them aloud since you put them down on paper. Since she the very beginning, that, I haven't spoken them aloud at all. Yeah, so she may have a better grasp of some of your uh, idiosyncrasies than you do. And she's probably true. I've noticed that there was another incident that I have where I've got it caught on a, on a bloopers reel that I did for something under a pen name. And uh, the uh, person doing the recording ran into a word that I can't recall what it was now that she just could not pronounce. <laughs> could not. I mean, there were like seven different attempts at trying to pronounce this word, all failing miserably. And then I was accused of being Chris Lester. Uh-huh. 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 Why do you have to use this word? It was a perfectly normal word. I I was I remember being astonished that she couldn't pronounce that one word. But then again, what do I know? I barely pronounce words as it is. Yes, we've noticed. It's always fun to hear you pronounce something that you've only read and never heard. Yeah. My and wife that, ribs that me for that very as well. often to you, actually. It it's does. Kind of crazy. That's what I get for reading a lot and failing to talk to human beings. <laughs> I was going to say it's like an Arnold Schwarzenegger moment from uh, Twins or whatever it was. Get to the chopper. The only, only book learning. No real world experience. Only book learning. Got to get out there in the world, man. Cutting back to the um, being thrown off by something. The book that I was listening to was a post-apocalyptic novel uh -oh. that that um i think i saw this post you probably did <laughs> unlike certain other ones where i i where i ran across something that annoyed me i uh, and i went on a rant about it and then i just started adding comments as each and everything that annoyed me happened and finally decided to delete the entire post because i shouldn't be saying that i caught myself early and didn't mention any specific details <laughs> so that i wouldn't have to delete the post but after a while if that's the way it gets when a story doesn't strike me well i'll find something to initially latch on that i think is unbelievable that knocks me out of the story and then it's harder to draw me back in and when you keep doing other things that knock me out of the story then i stop you i drop you and as i said i just let the characters die <laughs> i stopped caring that's what that's what i said in the post i just let the characters die Wow, that because is dark. In a post-apocalyptic setting, you expect somebody that doesn't know what's going on to make mistakes, but you expect that most people will not make mistakes that an average human being wouldn't make. You expect them to have a certain basic level of competence at interactions with other people and projecting what possible consequences are from their actions. And when you've got a story in a survival situation of people again and again and again, either discounting their circumstances 
or doing things that are actively against their best interests and just begging for somebody to come and do horrible things to them, you go, that's not realistic. I can't, I can't, I can't link up with these characters because they're idiots. <laughs> It's it's totally true. And then there's then there's technical issues. If you're going to write about guns and their effects, don't say stupid things that aren't backed up by the laws of physics. I'm going to use one specific example from this book so that you can I wondered whether or not we were going to get a real good one. Oh, this is a good one. I have never heard anything stated like this before and and I'm interested to hear your take on it. The main character was fighting somebody at night. He had a, a nine millimeter pistol and uh, he's trying to fight this guy in the night. And the guy says that it's dark out and you're going to have, you know, not a really good chance of hitting me. I've got a rifle over here. I think he had a shotgun actually. And, um, and even if you do hit me, the effects of your shot are going to be diminished. And that part got my thing. I was like, what does that even mean? And then they had he had the character shoot him in the shoulder with a nine millimeter from about 25 feet away. And the guy basically shrugged it off because apparently the darkness made the effect of the bullet somehow less. What? I'm like, Th what? That's not real. That's that's not physics. Are these people werewolves or no vampires or not something? even close? Huh. Normal human beings. We won't even mention the fact that this guy that got shot in the shoulder and was also shot by a rifle in the shoulder, but apparently the darkness again protected him, not just from being hit, but from some of the damage of being hit. A week later, he was back as if nothing had happened. Nothing at all. What huh. the fuck is that? Uh, unless you're, well. Hmm. But in any case. <sighs> You've got to be true to at least the laws of physics. Unless you're intentionally not being. If if nothing, if 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 you're starting from the get-go that things are bizarre and not don't work the way that things work here, or you introduce that somehow, that's fine. But yeah, if you don't have any other kind of elements to explain that in the story, it really won't make sense. Yeah. And that that sort of thing. And numerous things that people did that were inexplicable when compared to common sense that an average person would have and made me put it down because I said, this is not going to change. I'm a third of the way into this novel and it's not going to get any better. These people are going to continue to make stupid mistakes that they should not be making. And why am I going to put myself through that? So I stopped. Hmm, fair enough. Fair enough. When can a character be too dumb? I suppose it depends on the story. There are certain types of stories that you write where you'd want to have your main character be an idiot. I don't know that that would be to my taste in reading, but I'm sure that it could be. Confederacy Perhaps. of Dunces. Is, good, that, a, is that an actual book? Yes, it is. Very famous okay. book. Um, they're not all that bright <laughs> and yet they are. It, it's, it's one of those deals where, uh, you know, you talk about common sense. Some, sometimes writers will find characters who have their own code of common sense. Their interpretation of how to apply said common sense may not exactly match up with our version of common sense. <laughs> Well, I can sort of imagine a book where that would be. What if, what if you've got a story written, say, a, we're just going to make one up here, a post-apocalyptic story where you're writing from the point of view of hillbillies from the Appalachians. Okay. And their idea of what is common sense would probably not be the same as mine. Especially if environments were flipped. I meant if they're dealing with people on their home turf. Okay. Oh, oh, all right. And experiencing from an outsider. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Fair enough. So, yeah, I can see that. And, and perhaps the reader will think that they're stupid, but they're not stupid. People, people in general are not stupid. Just they're like ignorant. readers in general are not stupid. Well, 
Ignorance and stupidity, stupidity are two different things. People can be ignorant, but if you're looking at the environment in which they live in, if you're living up in the back end of nowhere, you don't need to know about all those highfalutin things that they know in the city. No, nope. that's and not your gonna, life. You're going to know everything about your back, your backyard. You're going to know everything appropriate to your setting. Just because somebody from the big city thinks you're an idiot does not make it as so. Right. Because now they're outside their pool of interest and they're going to look like the idiots. Did you ever watch uh, Love, Death, and Robots? I did not. Damn it. There's another episode in there that just cracked me the hell up. It, it's, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but it, it's, it's got a redneck or two in it. Uh, and they are treated like just, or, you know, in there to be, be, be the most foul, disgusting people on the, on the planet, but you end up really liking them. And, uh, when they finally get, uh, interact, when they get the chance to interact with, uh, somebody who, proper and formal and everything from the city, uh, things get a little wobbly. It's, it's pretty funny. It's very funny. We also read a story that had hillbillies in it. Do you remember? I, it's been years now, but we had a novel that we read that had a pair of brothers that were hillbilly scientists that lived in a bunker. I don't remember this. I can't remember the title. I can't remember the author. Maybe it was before your time, but it was it, it was done. My time. It was done for the show, and. It was interesting. I thought they were the most interesting characters out of the entire batch. I thought all the rest of them could probably die, and I'd be happy, you know, dealing with the a, a novel solely from the point of view of the Hillbilly Brothers because they were really fun. <laughs> I, I, I there's a scene I did not write uh, for Evolution. A couple scenes I didn't write for Evolution where I had the uh, the engineers uh, who were of the facility. And uh, their 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 names are going to be Mike Capus and, and Peter Bryant, and uh, th that also spawned an idea for a uh, offshoot series for the Black uh, called K and B Construction or K and B Engineering. I don't know which I'd call it, but I wanted to make them be like the grave diggers in Hamlet. I wanted them to be talking shit, jokes, everything else while they're doing very serious stuff, um, very deadly stuff. But they're still talking trash to one another, and uh, they treat hazards with with forced uh, understatement. <laughs> Even when they're scared to death, they're still you know talking shit and everything else, because it'd be fun, uh, two fun characters to hang out with, and uh, especially if they really know what they're doing on top of it. But they may appear from the outside to have no freaking clue what they're doing. While it's not connected, I read a news story last night that you telling me that made me think of because you said that. We have, um, there's buried in the Arlington National Cemetery, there is a soldier buried there who is the only victim of a nuclear accident on U.S. soil. Really? Yes. Um, actually, three people died in the event, but he died in such a way that his body is forever contaminated and he's buried in Arlington in a, um, a in a casket. sealed container under lead and under a concrete dome and his body cannot be moved without permission of the nuclear regulatory agency. Wow. Jesus Christ, what the hell they hit him with? The suspicion is it was suicide. He and two other people were working on an experimental reactor somewhere in the United States. I forget where. And he physically, with his bare hands, pulled out the cooling rod. <laughs> oh, shit. Um, before it came out, he already received more than enough dose. Oh, yeah. lethal dose of uh, radiation. But also before it finished coming out, the reactor exploded. And it drew, it drove fragments of the uh, cooling rod all throughout his body, which is the reason that he is buried underneath all of that because he is contaminated with long-lasting 
radioactive material that they can't possibly let out. Jesus. Well, we'll see you in 10,000 years, buddy. Maybe. Pretty much. So I don't know why your story of these two engineers doing this <laughs> reminded me of that story, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a Spock thing. Oh, the, the reactor's melting down. Oh, let me get in there and grab one of the fuel rods. Well, they think that he pulled it out because he wanted to die and he died before he even managed to finish pulling it out. They said that by the time it was 40 centimeters out of the uh, containment, out of the reactor, the reactor was exploding like had already the containment dome had blown at least two and a half meters up. Holy so shit. it happened in microseconds. Wow. Wow. That's really interesting. <laughs> I'll see if I can find the story and send you the link. But yeah, I read that. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> That is just nuts. <laughs> huh. Well, isn't that, that pretty much brought that conversation to a dead halt? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to imagine all the different ways that you could commit suicide and really fuck up a starship. And I think you just, you know, pinpointed one. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Heinlein wrote a story. What He had a character, and I read the story about it as well. In... um one of his young adult novels, Space Cadet, they have um, this tradition among the cadets that whenever they do roll call, they add roll calls for, for, I think it's four other people that have died doing tremendous things for society that were part of the organization. So they're always accounted for in every roll call. And one of them was someone that was involved in a battle. He was on the moon and he was lethally exposed to radiation and continued to, to hold the position and fight, even knowing that he was already a dead man, hmm. that nothing he could do could change his own mortality. He was done. And uh, then, I read the story afterwards. So there was a short story that actually spelled out what happened to him. And it was, it was more like he was doing whatever he could to stop it from happening and discovered that during the fight, he'd lost track of everything and he'd already taken a fatal dose. Hmm. It wasn't his intent to die. He was just a normal man that, that got caught up. If dying is your intent, that's really not much of a story. Nothing heroic in that. I disagree. All right. If, Bring it. If going through in a story, you can find a way to end an unhappy existence, there can be a point of view where you driving to be in a situation where you're going to die but do something positive can be a story element. All right. Now you're just talking about the end of Breaking Bad. Now that you mentioned it, I probably am, but I wasn't thinking about it. <laughs> That's a story element. It's not the story. It's not the story. You're right. I think the... I mean, I know you can write that kind of story and probably make a good one. I'm sure there are dozens out there. I tried to write several in my youth uh because i think all of us at some point end up writing about suicide or at least thinking it or having experienced uh the damage caused by it so you know it's one of those bugaboos and you'll you'll write about it but all the emotion that could be contained in that story aside it to me it's uh kind of an unsatisfying uh idea these days Whereas maybe before it wasn't so much when I was younger, but now it's, it just doesn't seem to interest me much. I can agree with that. So I, I, which is rather funny since, you know, Mr. No happy endings, but the, there is a point. It just, maybe, maybe my, my uh, tastes have changed or just from being around the world a longer time. I've kind of got uh, immune to, to uh, wanting that kind of story much less wanting to write it. So 
I guess things can change. But the character, if they're driven to do something where they know they're going to die, but they think it will serve a greater purpose, that's different. Than just, you know, what, what else can I take out on my way out? Of course, there's the story you need to write, Terry. You need to write about the uh, uh, the guy who's trying to, the guy or gal who are, who are trying to end their lives and fuck everything up spectacularly to the point where they end up saving lives and and failing to, you know, extinguish their own. Yeah. I can see where maybe a story about trying to end your life would be materially more relevant if, say, the person was immortal, was hunting for a way to die because he couldn't yeah. stand life anymore. Or uh, terminal, terminal disease, something along those lines. Yeah. That all makes sense. That You know, it's really funny you mentioned that. The It seems like... It seems like in most of these series that uh, encounter an immortal, you always encounter one who's extremely bitter about still being alive. <laughs> I mean, there's there's Cain and Lucifer. There's uh, um, at least one of those I've run into in Buffy. Um, how many vampire stories are full of vampires that just want to end it? It's uh, that brooding awful depression thing and gloom that surrounds you know their existence or whatnot if that's the way you're writing them we seem to be dealing with that an awful lot where people are uh, wondering whether or not longevity is actually something they want to aspire to it would have all kinds of things that would be very negative that most people don't think about i just watched a video talking about some of them today but even hearing about the subject, the first one is, look at how we react to society and how society reacts to us as we age. Right. By the time we're 60 or 70, we're curmudgeons who would prefer to just live wherever we do and not have to deal with people. Because people have become different, so different than what we expect of society that we have little common ground. Imagine that at 300 years. Imagine that at 3,000 years. Peter F. Hamilton kind of covered that in the Commonwealth saga because they're able to, uh, um, I can't remember the term for it now, but basically, you know, relife? I think it's relife or rejuve. I don't remember which. Either way, the body gets basically flashed back to whatever time period you want and uh, consciousness goes with it. But they were discussing that because somebody gets wiped and uh, their um, consciousness at that current moment is not backed up. Their backup, the previous backup, and personality completely changes because they're missing uh, decades of their lives. And so everything changes. Um, and they have to relearn, they have to relearn society again because it does change. And if you go back to a certain point, you you don't know how it's done. We see that in time travel stories all the time. Hey, this this is not the way things work. Well, yeah, it is. You're out of you're either before it or after it, but either way, this is the way it is. It's just you that are at, that is out of the loop. Another thing with living forever is our human brains can't continue to hold all that information. Our, the video said that we have the approximate capacity of, of 2.5 petabytes of data storage in our brains. That's big. That's not infinite. So as you age, you'll forget things. You'll forget important things. Say one of the reasons of living forever is you want to learn every language in existence. After 5,000 years, you could forget entire languages and not even know they're gone. Unless you're using them every day. Unless you're revisiting that every day, going right back. It's like a hard drive, man. If you don't, eventually those those little pieces, those little magnetic zeros and ones reset themselves. The data gets corrupted or it just gets uh, uh, fragmented, fragmented to the point where you can't really put it back together again easily. Mm -hmm. And the, the boredom. Works exactly like if you that. live forever, you've done everything. That's another, that's another gotcha. 
the only reason to that I could think of to live forever would be if I was capable of of uh, FTL travel and could go anywhere in the universe and check it out. But even That's, that seems like that would be a trap because after a while, space exploration, one system will look like another system. Right. Which is why Dr. Manhattan and the uh, uh, Watchmen is so emotionally aloof that his existence could be spent watching Adams being born. That's the kind of personality you would have to have in order to survive that. Sounds like he has, if he's watching Adams being born, it sounds like he has a quantum personality disorder. Oh, for crying out loud. Oh, that was perfect for it. Ah, oh, God. Oh, this topic also goes back to another little short in Love, Death, and Robots. Holy shit. We're just all over the Love, Death, and Robots today. Oh, I am. Some of us are. Yeah. <laughs> Got to, I haven't watched it in a month or two, but still it's like just rattling around my head because all these little pieces just kind of keep coming up and topics and in these other books, you know, a lot of other books that you read, a lot of other stories or, or media you digest these, these, all these topics are already there. People are already discussing this and have been writing about it for a very, very, very long time. Nothing new. Well, while we were talking, I, I went online here and looked up the specific of what happened in that Robert Heinlein story. And um, the story where it happened was called The Long Watch. It was a short story by Heinlein. And basically what happened is the patrol was made up of different Western, different officers from different nations, and there was an attempted coup on the moon, and they tried to take over the atomic missiles there, and his only way to stop them was to pull out the fissionable material by hand. Mm. Ow. thereby getting fatal radiation burns. It sounds like a lot of fun. The story was good. But then again, I don't know that I've ran across a Robert Heinlein story I didn't like. Even the strange ones, like Stranger in a Strange Land. The strange ones. <laughs> if you ever read Stranger in a Strange Land? I got through maybe a third of it. It's a strange one. <laughs> Oh, then there's Friday, of course. Friday was a very enjoyable story. Who doesn't like a female robot looking into, you know, what's going on with humanity? <laughs> and shagging as many of them as she can. <laughs> that that has been known to happen. Free love, baby. This is Robert Heinlein. He was writing in 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 that age. This actually, I suspect Friday came before, you know, the 60s. I don't remember when that was. I don't remember. It's been it so long since I read that. I, I can't remember. I, I can only remember the sex scenes and only barely. <laughs> so what happens when you're 15 and you read that shit? Friday was written in 1982. So, okay. yeah, that could definitely take the uh, the 60s and roll it into that. All right. 82. I didn't realize it was that recent. Okay. He he's published stuff from the forties all the way through the eighties and, and beyond until his death. I don't remember exactly when he died, but he was a very prolific author. Yeah. Speaking of authors that, that you think were prolific that weren't, I heard that, uh, you know who Robert E. Howard is, right? Yeah. Conan. He died when he was 30. Really? I did not know that. If he wrote all of that stuff that was so cool. Imagine what it would be like if he had till he was 60 or 70. Holy shit. Oh, so many musicians and writers you can say that about mm -hmm. and artists in general. You know, what what would they have created had they lived another two decades? Yeah, that's always going to be the question. Imagine if Terry lived another 50 years. How many books would we have in Empire of Bones? Where would it end? Is there an end? Nope, never an end. It just keeps on going forever. I just keep moving the goalposts. <laughs> <laughs> that is an interesting concept, moving the goalposts. It's totally true because the characters had a certain set of goals that they were after when this started. As the story progressed, I moved the goalposts a little further away because their knowledge had expanded. Now what they needed was something beyond what they originally did. By the time they solve what they originally set out to do, if they can solve it, there's a whole new set of problems. So I have moved the goalpost. 
Ah, uh, yeah, I have not been known to do that at all. Well, you just keep moving until everyone dies, so there's a <laughs> limit to how far you can move it then. I, I don't move the goalposts. I pick up the entire fucking arena and put it somewhere else just to fuck with everybody. <laughs> Does somebody see an arena around here? I could have sworn there was one right here. Wait a minute. This is not where we were five minutes ago. What are we Holy doing shit. Now? Imagine our hypothetical immortal coming back to visit a city after 500 years. There was a restaurant here. <laughs> oh, God. Can you imagine that? I'm like that after five years. <laughs> In Houston, it's like that after five minutes. It could be. <laughs> In 500 years, it'd be like you come back and there's a field there. I swear to God, Houston was right here when I left it. <laughs> Where did it go? They rebuilt themselves so many times they just sunk into the earth. <laughs> now that's New Orleans. <laughs> no, that's different. They, will, they won't sink into the earth as much as get covered by it and sunk. You get covered by the ocean. I think New Orleans is like, what, 10 or 15 feet below sea level? Uh, the one area, yeah. That one area? So I'm not sure. It, it may, 500 years, it may sink out of sight. Who knows? Oh, I think. It was think, built on a swamp. Yeah, I think it will It will eventually go bye-bye. But yeah, so will Houston. So we, we won't, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> by the time you're talking about. We're not going to be here for it. Yeah, we're not going to be here for it. And the ocean will swallow it all anyway. So it won't even matter. There was a a, um, a story that I read, something waves that was based out of Houston after global warming melted everything and the sea level rose over the city. And the character was a salvager that would go into the sunken city and salvage things. God damn it. I was going to write that book. It was actually really good. I'm serious. I was going to write that book. <laughs> <laughs> a funny thing happened on the way to Derelict. <laughs> I mean, I do have characters from the Dallas Dome, so you know, it could happen. Yeah, well, I I don't know the title, but I I couldn't find it on a quick search. But yeah, I read that book a couple of years, well, maybe a decade ago. I'm still interested in when you're actually going to write these prequels. I'm going to start the first prequel as soon as I finish the next Empire book. How far back in the past are you going? five to six hundred years okay just prior to the fall because the main character is going to be involved in the fall but the story is going to her story is going to start probably 20 or 30 years before it okay <sighs> i had some interesting thoughts last night regarding uh um what's next after derelict Mm -hmm. <laughs> that will have to be an offline conversation at some point but uh um yeah i can see you grinning over there but it it just led to some interesting uh conversations we we had after after mal about uh his his view of ais and, and when said that uh in my universe they're emerging that gave me some very interesting ideas on how to uh, uh, more things I want to write about. Many more things I want to write about. How does society change when suddenly the rules have changed? And whether that's being from a, um, suddenly discovering there's an interstellar threat or uh, suddenly discovering what you the way you thought things worked is not the way they work. Or if you go Battlestar Galactica and suddenly humanity gets really fucking paranoid. Maybe with good reason about the toys they created that are now, you know, self-winding. So you're going to be dealing with that kind of situation, right? Because if, if the fall is going on, then all the rules are changing around people minute by minute. Yes, that is going to be a crisis of incredible proportions when it hits. Because it's the end of the world. Right. Like when I mentioned Battlestar Galactica, first freaking episode, I mean, it's it's on. The fall yeah. is here. There's 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 no running away from it. Everything has changed. Everything. Everything you thought you knew about society, everything you thought you knew about civilization, everything you maybe even thought you knew about religion or science or anything else is out the fucking window. Yeah, that's it's very comparable. And but unlike them, I'm not going to start immediately with that. I'm going to start with 
the character when she is young before she even becomes a Marine. Then I'm going to deal with her growing up as, as a member of the military, dealing with all of the stigma of her background and all the perfidy of the race that she came from. I'm going to detail it all out and then it's going to come to a, a massive conclusion. Then you start throwing the China plates. Yes. Then I pretty much turn the bull loose in the China shop <laughs> and we get to see if anybody got away. <laughs> and did any of the China survive? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we already know that one piece survived because that's where the empire books are taking place. Yes. But don't you think it's likely that others perhaps survived? Yeah. Oh yeah. So that's going to be an aspect I'll explore, but just like empire, I expect that, that uh, Imperial Marines is going to have a lot to explore there. It's going to be unlike empire. It's going to be more military science fiction than space opera. Okay. That makes sense. Because when you're, when you're really buried in a military unit fighting a war, guess what? That's military science fiction. What's and I wanted, I wanted to write it that way. That's, that was my entire point of deciding to do that series is while I love doing space opera, you can't really say, okay, this empire book is going to be a military science fiction book. No, that would, that would change the tone of everything that you've done before. And that's bad. But if I start another series set in the same universe, even if earlier I can have a different tone to it and it'll be okay. What about writing stories from the civilians point of view? I could certainly do that as well. Is yes. Could, is it something you're interested in doing? I thought about writing like a mystery series set in the Empire universe. But I'm probably not going to do it. Hmm. I've already got enough on my plate. But just yeah. because it's just because it's interesting doesn't mean that I should go off down that rabbit hole. I have uh two books in mind that will take place after Derelict that are aftermath and take place before the next series kicks off <laughs> and uh i am interested in them because they, they would they would give me a chance to really talk about the societal changes in a big big way so it's it's something that that i have to or really want to do but i don't like you i don't know if i'll have time to do it might make some interesting novellas though it's true you can always explore just about anything in a novella or a short story. Uh, Mal's conversation about AI last week really got my head going. Really got my head going. I blame you for all of this. Hey, that's okay. I can live with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have wandered around again for like an hour. It's true, but we actually stayed perhaps a little closer to our our topic than we often do. <laughs> well, two weeks ago, I was on enough cold medicine to knock down an elephant. So, you know, I had my excuses. You didn't have an excuse. You could have guided me in the right direction, just kind of led my sorry, sleepy ass where we were going. But It was much more entertaining to watch you stumble around in the dark. Oh, gee, thanks. I'm glad when I need you, you're there for me. I'm all about, you know, being that guy. <laughs> How wonderful for you. Well, why don't you get us the hell out of here? Well, folks, if you'd like to send us a note and talk about our meandering and, and all of the various subjects we've touched on today, you can send us an email at show at deadrobotsociety.com. You can find Paul on Twitter at Paul underscore E underscore Cooley. Better yet, go to Facebook and find us at the listeners of the Dead Robot Society Facebook group. We have to thank Podhoster for hosting all the audio episodes of this for your listening pleasure. We also need to go ahead and point out that we have video. If you haven't seen our ugly mugs, you can go to youtube.com slash DRS podcast and be horrified at what we look like. Because trust me, <laughs> we don't look anything like what we sound like. <laughs> I, I got nothing. I have you, no <laughs> response to any of that. <laughs> you, you totally shouldn't have anything to that. And of course, you can always support us on Patreon at patreon, 
dot com slash DRS podcast, where for as little as a dollar a month, you can get exclusive content and help us support the show and keep Paul in whatever it is that Paul keeps himself in. <laughs> wow. That's uh wow. <laughs> that kind of comment just wow. I know it's that's all very vague and kind of sinister when you really get down to it. And at the ten dollar level, you get your name read as Paul does the clumsy segue to get away from scary Terry. And our ten dollar patrons are Andrew Smallwood, JD Barker, Sue Bayman, also not a possum. Really? Okay. Aaron Meiser, Jesse, Terry's cat should have their own podcast or cut. I totally agree with you. Veronica Jaguar, not a possum. Jack F. Erickson, Kelson, a tutor who tutored a flute. Isabel Cushy, Rick, where have all the words gone, Shaw? They're there, dude. I'm telling you. Lisa Slack, Nathan Cosby, Cheryl Winters, Tracy Bodine, Devin Lee, Drew Mission, I'm possible. I'm possible. Bernardi. Chris Winder, Andre Conde Moraes, DJ Chamberlain, and J.R. Hanley. Thanks very much for your support, folks. We appreciate it. Yeah, yes. Thank you very much, patrons. And um, the names, come on. Y'all can do better. Y'all can. And with that, we are out of here. See you guys in a week. See y'all next week. Bye.